Good morning, church family. It's great to be together. It's great to be here on Father's Day. I'm blessed, of course, I always have my wife with me, but I also have my beautiful daughter with me. And we also have with us a very close friend of ours, uh, Tammy Underwood. She's been friends with Dana for years, and we've drawn very close to her family. And if you're here for the first time, um, we want you to know that you're welcome here. We want you to know that uh, we appreciate your presence here today. Um, but I want to extend a happy Father's Day to all of our dads, or all of our granddads, all of our great-granddads. Um, it, it's, uh, do we have any great-grandfathers here? Any great-grandfathers? No. We have a, we've got some, well, there we go. Three generations dads there, that's awesome. Well, inside your bulletin, you're going to find, as we always do every week, Chad produces one of these, and every time I, I speak, I also like to have a study sheet there, something for you to fill out, something for you to take home with you, something to look back on later regarding uh, our lesson. Today being Father's Day, I'm especially mindful of my dad. I have got some really great memories of my dad, and I miss him deeply. He went home to be with the Lord about six and a half years ago. He was a wonderful and godly father. He had a huge influence on my life, not only teaching me to live a life of integrity and instilling godly values and truth into my life, but also exemplifying those things in his personal life as well. But perhaps this is not a particularly joyous day for you. Uh, maybe you don't have a father that fit the paradigm of the video that we just watched. Uh, perhaps your father uh, was not front and center in your life or deeply invested in your family, or maybe your father wasn't present in your life at all due to unfortunate circumstances, or maybe even his own choices. Well, I have some good news for you this morning. None of us are fatherless. None of us are fatherless. We have a loving father in heaven, a perfect father who loves us deeply, and he longs to call each and every one of us his children. This morning, I'd like to show you that through a familiar story in God's word. So I invite you, as you have your tablets and phones and maybe hard copy of the scriptures, to go to uh, Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. This is often referred to as the gospel within the gospel, the good news within the good news, and you will soon see why that is. Beginning in Luke chapter 15, we find Jesus is out teaching a large crowd. And this crowd is made up of all kinds of people. Uh, some were there uh, because they were desperately hopeless and hurting. There were some who struggled with the consequences of sinful behaviors and lifestyles. And there were some that were despised by society, such as the unscrupulous tax collectors. These were people who were rarely, if ever, seen at the synagogue on Sabbath. Well... Jesus is teaching, and everybody's listening, and off standing to the side are those who are devoutly religious. These are the scribes, the teachers of the law, the uh, Pharisees. These men were respected, they were responsible, and of course, they were devoutly religious. The religious leaders frequently showed up at these kinds of gatherings. Uh, but unfortunately, they were prideful and they were very judgmental and they were only there to watch our Lord's every move and to listen to every, every word he had to speak and say to tr hopefully try and find fault. Well, here they are in this group now and our Lord hears them murmuring. This man welcomes sinners and even eats with them. So in response to their grumbling, Jesus tells three parables. And I, I refer to these as the lost and found parables. And we know that parables are earthly stories that speak a spiritual truth or tell a spiritual, uh, teach a spiritual truth. Some people say that uh, parables are earthly stories with a heavenly meaning. And uh, so we're going to go into this story that is a parable. This is not a real-time thing that Jesus witnessed. This is a story that he's telling to teach an important truth. In the first parable, Jesus frames the story as a question. I find that interesting. He draws the crowd in. 
What among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the other 99 in the open pasture and go after that one is lo that, that's lost until he finds it, and then he throws it up on his shoulders and heads home rejoicing. In the second parable, Jesus tells a story of a woman. She has 10 silver coins. She loses one of those coins, and she turns the house inside and out looking for that one silver coin, and when she finds it, she rejoices. Now, I'll tell you, as many times as I've lost my keys, I can tell you I relate to that poor lady. In both of these parables, the person who loses something uh, is devastated, and they aggressively go after it until they found what they've lost. And then when they find it, they gather all of their friends and throw a party to celebrate. And at the end of the first parable of the lost sheep, Jesus says this. He says, in the same way... Uh, there is rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who don't feel the need to repent. And then he reiterates that again in the second parable. He says, in the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The message is clear. God is not a God of religion. God is a God of relationships, and he will pardon anyone who has a contrite and repentant heart. And then Jesus tells one last story that drives this point home, and that's, that, that's the story that I really want to focus on this morning. It, it takes this into, into a much deeper, deeper level. As powerful as those first two parables were, the third parable is really, really drives the point home that Jesus is trying to make in, in a very, very real way. Because it's not about losing an animal or an inanimate object. It's about a father who loses his son. We often refer to this story as the parable of the prodigal son. This is a parable wh where we can readily find ourselves in the story. And I invite you to find yourself in the story this morning. Wove into the story are several family dynamics which we can easily relate to. It touches on sibling rivalry, alienation of family, the consequences of foolish living, and, and the joy of reunion and the power of forgiveness. Each one of these topics are important by themselves. And each of those topics could give us plenty to think about. But this morning, instead of focusing on these important topics, I would really like to focus on the response of the loving father to his wayward son. As we focus on the father in the story, we will see the vivid picture of the heart and the character of our loving heavenly father. And those of us who are fathers and grandfathers, we see a perfect model that we can follow, follow as we raise our children and our grandchildren and lead our families. Our story opens in verse 11 of Luke 15. A wealthy man has two sons and the youngest of the two sons goes to the father and asks for his share of the inheritance. Now, in the first century, it was not uncommon for a father to, to divide his estate before his death, especially if he was ready to step back and turn things over to his sons. However, it was very uncommon, and I would even say downright disrespectful, for a son to ask his father for his share of the inheritance while his father was still living. This request was a horrible slap on the father's face, and it was coming from the son who was least entitled. The oldest son was entitled to more of an inheritance. And here comes the youngest son. It's, this request was akin to the son going to his dad and saying, Dad, I'm not going to sit around and wait till you kick the bucket to get my share of the inheritance. Give that to me now. You can see how self-centered that is and how shameful that request is. We will soon find this was only the, the first of the many sins that the son would commit in this story. But before we start examining the sins of the prodigal son, we have to approach this story and pause, facing an unfortunate reality about ourselves. We are all prone to making wrong choices and mistakes. So just like the wayward son, we think prodigal thoughts, we speak prodigal words, and we act out in prodigal ways. In other words, we all have a sinful nature, and from time to time, even if we've surrendered our lives to Christ, that sinful nature still rears its ugly head. The Apostle Paul describes it this way. 
I've discovered this principle of life that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there's another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So you see how it is in my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. The battle is raging within each of us. The battle is real, and the struggle is daily. There's a constant tension that's going on in our hearts and our minds all the time. It's a tension between righteousness and evil, between right and wrong, and between holiness and unholiness. But praise God, we have a loving father who understands the enemy and has equipped us for that spiritual battle. And through the power of his spirit and the truth of his word, we can live victoriously. Well, going back to the parable now, let's take a look at how the father responds to the, to the son's dishonoring request. In verse 12, Jesus simply said that the father divided his estate between his two sons. Between his two sons. Did you catch that? Not only did the father give the younger son his share of the estate, but he gave the older son his share as well. What a beautiful picture of the great generosity of our God. Just like the loving father in this story, our loving father gives freely. That's the first number one point there on your outline. You could also include the words abundantly or sacrificially. Our loving father gives abundantly. Our loving father gives sacrificially. Our loving father gives freely. Look at what the apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. He says, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. God, our loving Father, gives us life and breath and shelter and food to eat. He generously provides for all, all of our physical needs. But our God also blesses us with spiritual blessings. As the Apostle Paul wrote in his letter to the church in Ephesus, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Through his spirit, our loving Father gives us strength in the challenges of life and comfort in our sadness. He gives us peace in our suffering and hope when we are discouraged, and the list just goes on and on. But there's another blessing, and I, I believe this is a blessing that we often overlook. Our loving Father gives us the freedom of choice, and he honors our free will. He doesn't force us to obey him or to love him, and I have to say I deeply appreciate that about God, because if God forced us to love him, it wouldn't really be love, because genuine and deep love comes by choice. So even at the risk of breaking his heart, our loving Father still blesses us with the freedom to choose. This is well illustrated in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 30, verses 15 through 19. In Deuteronomy, chapter 30, God is really speaking through Moses to the nation of Israel. They're getting ready to enter the land of Canaan, the promised land. And here's what he says. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction, for I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, and to keep his commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live, live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. Now here comes the choice. But if your heart turns away and you are not obedient, and if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. Well, now let's take a look into the parable now and see what kind of choices did the younger son make with his inheritance. 
Jesus says in verse 13, not long after receiving his inheritance, the younger son got together all that he had and he set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in uh, wild living. At first, the wayward son's new life probably seemed amazing. He gets far away from home as far as he possibly can and he quickly finds some like-minded friends who just want to party and have a great time. He pampers himself with the, the finest of food and wine, and he indulges himself in women. The freedom is intoxicating, both literally and figuratively. I'm sure the young man's friends all thought, oh, boy, this guy's really living the life. But all the while, day by day, he was dying the death that sin and reckless living bring about. Well, things got worse. His money completely ran out. And all of the so-called friends disappeared. And then a famine strikes the land. Now for the first time in his entire life, the young man is starting to feel impoverished. He has no idea where he's going to live or even how he's going to eat. So he, he tries to find a job. And he looks around and he finally gets a job working for a man who has pigs. And guess what? The man sends him out to the field to feed the pigs. Do you realize just how demoralizing that job would be? I wouldn't want that job. But for this young Jewish man, <clears throat> this young Jewish man, it was even worse. He was working for a Gentile to begin with, a non-Jewish uh, person, and his job was feeding pigs. These were animals that the Hebrew law said were unclean and shouldn't be touched. Definitely, this was not what this young man had in mind when he went out his father's door to take on the world. No one cared. He had no connections, no more friends, no more status. All of it was gone, and it's as if he didn't exist. And that emptiness in his stomach reminded him of the emptiness of his life. Meanwhile, back at home, his loving and faithful father waited and watched patiently for his son to return home. This is a perfect example and portrait of how our loving father watches and waits patiently for us. That's the second point on your outline. No matter how far we, we are from God or how bad we have fallen away, our loving father never gives up on us. And because he loves us, he believes the best in us rather than the worst. He never quits hoping and he patiently waits for us to repent and to surrender our lives to him in loving obedience. Listen to what the apostle Peter says in 2 Peter 3, verses 8 and 9. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. Some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And then you go further down in that chapter, verse 15. Peter says, bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. When we become followers of Christ, our life tells a story of divine patience. God was patient with us as we were lost in our sins, ignoring his son, placing our will over his, and scarcely giving him or the salvation he offers even so much as a passing thought. And he's patient with us now as we daily need his forgiveness and our loving father will be patient with us tomorrow and the next day and the day after that until our Lord returns while the father was patiently at home watching and waiting his wayward son had sunk into complete hopelessness and despair he was dirty he was exhausted and he was hungry his clothes were reduced to rags and the, the pores of his skin were filled with the stench of the pig pen the reality of his sin struck hard. He began evaluating his life, which, by the way, is the first step to repentance. He began evaluating his life. And he thought about his life, the, the, the life that he had at home, back with his dad, in the comforts of that home, and, and, and the love that was present in that home. And it says in verse 17 of Luke it's, uh, 15, this is when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. 
I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. That's what he rehearsed in his heart. So he got up and he went to his father. All the while, the father continued to watch and wait. Then one day, the father's hopes were turned to joy. The father looked out across the horizon and he could see a little tiny silhouette of his wayward son coming home. At the end of verse 20, we read, but while he was still a long way off, the, his father saw him and then was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. In his deep compassion, the father ran to the son and hugged him and kissed him. It was, it was an embrace filled with grace, and it was a kiss of mercy. In that very moment, the son knew he was fully forgiven. What an awesome scene. What a glimpse into the heart of God, our loving Father. Through the Father's response to the Son, Jesus shows us that, third point now, our loving Father forgives fully. The Apostle John writes these familiar words. If we confess our, our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And you know what Chad says about the word all. All means all. There's not a single sin that, that if we will confess that before God, that he will not forgive. There's not a single one. And then we find this in Psalms 103. I'm sorry. Uh, Isaiah, Isaiah 55. Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him now while he's near. Let the, uh, let, the, let the wicked change their ways and banish the very thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to our God, for he will forgive generously. And now Psalms 103. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, that's to say, he will not continually keep accusing us of our sin. When it's forgiven, it's forgiven. He will not accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed the transgressions from us. The very fact that the father ran to the son and embraced him and kissed him is a profound statement of the father's forgiveness. Now let me tell you why. In the first century, no self-respecting Middle Eastern man ever ran. You know that? He never ran. There was a reason for it, because they wore long tunics. And for him to run meant he had to hoist that tunic up close to his knees so that he could, he could run. But the father ran to the son. You see... If he hoisted his tunic up, his bare legs would show, and that was considered a disgrace. So here's a lesson, or not a lesson, but a question for you. If it was shameful for a man to run in that culture, why did the father run when his son returned to him? What would compel the father to shame himself? Before we answer that question, we have to understand an important first century Jewish custom. If a Jewish son lost or squandered his inheritance among Gentiles and then wanted to return home, the community would perform a ceremony called a kazaza. The community would gather, and they would have the son brought to the town square, and then they would break a large pot in front of him, and in unison, they would yell out, you are now cut off from uh, your people. They would all shout that in unison. And from that day forward, the entire community would totally reject him. So now back to our question. Why did the father run, knowing that was such a shameful thing to do? He was willing to, to take on some shame. Well, when you look at that, it, it really just comes clear. We can't discount the father's immense compassion and love, but he also ran in order to get to his son before his son entered the village. 
the father runs and shames himself and runs as fast as he can in an effort to get to his son so that his son would not have to experience the shame, the rejection, and the humiliation of the taunting villagers. After the emotional reuniting of the prodigal son with his father, it would be clear that there, there would be no kazaza ceremony. There would be no rejecting of his son despite what his son had done. The son had repented and returned to the father. The father had taken the full shame upon himself that should have fallen upon his son and had clearly shown to the entire community that his son was forgiven and welcome home. In this parable we're looking at this morning, this morning, only the father could restore the son to full sonship in the family. In the same way, we are sinners, and there's absolutely nothing we can do within ourselves to restore our lost relationship with our loving father. He calls us and patiently watches and waits, and all we have to do is just take one single repentant step in his direction, and because of his compassion and love, he'll come running, and he'll come running to welcome us home. We do not have to fear going home to our Father and confessing our sins, no matter what we've done or how many times we've done it. He lifts off that weight of guilt that we carry because of our mistakes and our sin. He lifts it, and then he's willing to, to wipe that slate clean. Why does he do that? Now here's your fourth and final point on the outline. Our loving Father loves us lavishly. Look now at verses 21 through 24. See how this unfolds. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father sent, said to his servants, he turned to his servants, and he says, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he's found. So they began to celebrate. The son had barely poured his confession out of his mouth. In fact, if you recall, he, there was a second part of that confession where he was willing to be one of his father's servants. But he didn't even get that out of his mouth before the father called the servants to get the robe, the best robe, and put it on him. The best robe was a special robe that was kept in the house and usually wealthier families were more inclined to have this. And it was, it was the, only the father could wear this special robe, and it was only for the most special of occasions. But it was also uh, a robe that was uh, brought out for digni dignitaries and special guests if they were visiting the home or coming for dinner. So he's calling for that special robe. And the father had the servants bring the ring and some sandals, and the symbolism in that is also huge. The ring would likely be a signet ring that bore the family crest. It would identify the son in a very visible way to the family and the community. But what about the sandals? Sandals were only worn by family members, not the servants, not the slaves. So placing sandals on the son's feet would restore him as a member of the family rather than as a slave. The father in this parable pulled out all the stops and he lavished his love on his son in the same way that our father lavishes his love on us. In 1 John 3, 1, we find this. See what great love the father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Oh, but it gets better than that. In the last few verses of the scripture text that Phil read to us this morning, I'm going to begin in Galatians 4, through beginning in verse 4. But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out Abba Father. That was an endearing name that Hebrew children would call their, their father. We, we, he, the Spirit prompts us to call out Abba Father. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. 
Our loving Father loves us so lavishly that when our lives are found in Jesus Christ, he calls us his children. So there's a question here. Are you one of God's children? Have you surrendered your life to Christ? And as his children, he has made us heirs of promises and heirs of an eternal inheritance that is kept in heaven for us. He not only lavishes his love upon us now, but he lavishes his love on us for all eternity. This reminds me of an awesome song that plays on my Pandora music station periodically. It's sung by country singer George Strait. The song is titled, A Love Without End. Every time I hear this song, my mind is, goes right back to Luke 15. And I'm also reminded of the wonderful, lavish love of our Heavenly Father. Listen to these lyrics. I, guess I got sent home from school one day with a shiner on my eye. Fighting was against the rules, and it didn't matter why. When Dad got home, I told the story just like I'd rehearsed, and then stood there on my trembling knees and waited for the worst. He said, let me tell you a secret about a father's love, a secret that my daddy said was just between us. He said, daddies don't just love their children every now and then. It's a love without end, amen. It's a love without end, amen. When I became a father in the spring of 81, there was no doubt that stubborn boy was just like my father's son. And when I thought my patience had been tested to the end, I took my daddy's secret and I passed it on to him. I said, I said let me tell you a, a secret about a father's love, a secret that my daddy said was just between us. He said, daddies don't just love their children every now and then. It's a love without end. Amen. It's a love without end. Amen. Last night I dreamed I had died and stood outside those pearly gates. And suddenly I realized there must be some mistake. If they know half the things I've done, they'll never let me in. And a voice spoke to me from the other side, and I heard those words again. He said, let me tell you a secret about a father's love, a secret that my daddy said was just between us. He said, daddies don't just love their children every now and then. It's a love without end. Amen. It's a love without end. Amen. Our loving Father loves us so lavishly. He loves us lavishly and he calls us to be his children and we can be a child of his. And that's only possible through the great sacrifice of our Lord and Savior Jesus and all that he did at Calvary, giving his body and blood. But we see over and over and over again in the story how deeply God loves us and he lavishes his love on us and it's a love without end. Amen. Will you bow with me?